Joe White, thank you so much for joining us here. Speak to a lawyer um, where we discuss interesting careers and uh, dissect people's lives and the law, their stories. Um, it's a pleasure to have you join us all the way from Tel Aviv, Israel, where you're a managing partner of Herzog, one of Israel's leading law firms. Um, the reputation of the firm that you lead um, is, is great. I've known uh, some of the founders. Um, Herzog is currently the, the president of Israel. I believe it was founded by his father. Um, also, Neiman, the former name, uh, Yaakov Neiman was a justice minister. Um, and, and Fox, uh, a British guy, I, I discovered recently that I'm related to him through marriage somehow. So um, tell me about uh, your career. You're, you're from the UK. How did you uh, land up at Herzog and ultimately managing the firm? Interesting question. Thank you for having me. Um, so how far back do we go? So I actually was born in Israel. Um, not that it sounds like that from my accent. Um, when I was a baby, which was pretty soon after the Yom Kippur War, um, my parents decided that the last thing they wanted was to see their children in army uniform. So they left the UK, uh, they left Israel, moved to the UK. Um, I was brought up in my formative years in Manchester, studied at University College London, and did my my training um, at a large international firm, Freshfields in London. And this is the late 90s, um, and Freshfields were international counsel to the company which built and manages what was the first toll road in Israel, road number six, Vishesh. Um, and I was a young bag carrier, not doing anything very important on that transaction. Um, we were an international firm together with an Israeli firm, Yuda Rabbeh, and on the other side of the table to us representing the banks was another international firm, Alan Lovry, what was then a very small firm from Israel called Herzog, uh, known then as HFN. Um, we get to the end of the transaction, so we're now in 1999, and for some strange reason, um, they think maybe we're a good idea to give this young guy an offer to make Aliyah and come and be a finance lawyer, a project finance lawyer in Israel. So on the 22nd of March 2000, for the first time I walk into the office of Herzog, um, have a lot of fun for the next 20 years. Um, and then about three or four years ago, the suggestion came up that, well, maybe I might be a good fit to take over from the men, then managing partner, Mayor Linton, who'd been managing partner here forever, who'd been managing partner for 25 years. Um, and in on the 1st of April, um, 2021, um, I became managing partner. Now, it was really interesting because on the job description to be managing partner, was there was not a pandemic. There was not um, nine months of civil warfare in Israel around the legal reform, and there was not a war. Um, so my time as managing partner of this place has been somewhat interesting. Right. Uh, but that, that's how I got to where I am. Wow. So, so tell me about the 20 plus years of your career. I mean, Israel's experienced uh, unprecedented growth, amazing growth, especially, I believe, in, in your field, corporate gaming. Um, yeah. how, how's, you know, 20 plus years of, of uh, the career at a top firm been for you? Um, a little out of the box is probably the best expression, but that might be some something that people used to describe me anyway. Um, so when I first got here, as I said, I came here to be a finance lawyer and did spend the early part of my career here doing a whole bunch of deals for Israeli banks, particularly Bank of Poly, have been financing projects outside of Israel. And basically everything I've done for those 20 years has been outward facing of Israel. It's also one of the specialities of the firm. Um, but in my first few weeks here, um, I got a phone call from the then managing partner, the same mayor I mentioned. He said, look, there's some guys coming in. I know the guys. Um, I don't exactly know what they do. He said, this is probably May 2000. So it's something to do with the roulette wheels. I've never been in a casino. It's something to do with the internet. This was the then managing partner of 
Hey, Lord, family, so I'm not really sure what the internet is. I walk in a room, I meet the founders of a company that became known as 888. Um, I very quickly stopped being a um, suited and booted finance lawyer um, and became an internet gaming lawyer and have really spent my career advising almost every gaming company one can think of, both Israeli and non-Israeli. One of my biggest clients is the largest um, gaming company out of Romania. Um, and I have a whole amazing team here. Um, and that morphed into a whole bunch of other fields, if it's fintech, if it's blockchain, crypto, um, everything which is regulated on the internet um, tends to fall under my domain. Uh, less startups, more established companies. Um, and that's really what I've spent the last 20 years of my life doing, as I say, enjoying the ride. Well, uh, I mean, it's an interesting discussion about the regulation and compliance you mentioned in these new industries. I, I started the early part of my career doing compliance at the big financial institutions uh, in Israel and financial institutions are have a lot more developed or mature compliance regimes. So how does it work being a lawyer for like a, in the crypto world where there's it's the wild west where there's there's no real compliance? Is it, you know, how do you rein clients in and um, what's what's your take? And you rein clients in? I'm not no, sure I mean, clients, how, how I'm, you, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure clients can be reined in. Maybe they can. Um, so I'm just thinking um, of like a Sam, Bank, Sam Bankman free type guy as a client and, you know, the Wild West, yeah. people do what they want and, and yeah. uh, you so, know, so, how you lay down the law. So, so it's, uh, look, it's an interesting question. Um, I'll start in the gaming sphere, then I'll move to crypto. Um, so back in my early days as a internet gaming lawyer, and remember that the gaming world is normally bricks and mortar, right? It's a casino in the UK, it's a betting shop, it's a slot machine parlor. So countries know how to regulate and license physical venues. And suddenly we find the entire world moving into the online sphere. And lawmakers and regulation always comes after um, technological development, social change in the past. Um, and I remember getting this quite legal opinion. We went to a lawyer in Belgium and asked him for a legal opinion as to whether a gaming company with its servers in one country could offer to people situated in Belgium to play on those servers. And his legal opinion was really interesting. He, it started off by saying in 1886, there was a law in Belgium. So 1886 was before the advent of the telephone, let alone the advent of the internet. And he says, because of the website of my then company started WWW, World Wide Web, uh, it must be public, a public place because it's in the world. And therefore, this 1886 law attaches itself to gaming in public places. What you're doing is illegal. So, which clearly was, which, which, which clearly with great respect to, to that particular guy whose name I won't mention was, was absolute tosh. Um, so the key in regulation and compliance is assisting your clients to understand how existing laws apply and where existing laws don't apply, either to encourage them to take on some levels of self-regulation. Many companies in the industries I'm involved with and most of my clients um, take on some form of self-regulation and compliance. Um, and it's a large amount of a risk analysis. Um, and crypto is basically, basically the same. Um, you know, there are financial services regulations. Crypto is a digital asset. Uh, but, but again, you know, the world has moved slowly. Therefore, you know, the EU has moved faster than the US. The SEC in the US had an opportunity five years ago to take this issue under its, um, under its umbrella, bring in some regulations, and therefore it would not be the Wild West. The SEC opted to do something else. Um, and part of the trick, and without any reference to the individual you mentioned, is also picking your clients with care, right? I've met a whole bunch of people over the years, uh, some of whom were a lot of fun to meet, but I'm not particularly sure that they should be clients of Herzog. Um, so it's, you know, you pick your clients, 
you hope that they listen to at least some of what you say and um, you go to sleep quietly at night, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Sounds sounds like a very interesting career you've had at the forefront of change and development, uh, economic development. It's it's pretty interesting. Now, in the past couple of years as a managing partner, I'm just curious, do you get to practice law? Is it more managing? So... I'm giving you the political answer, I'm giving you the truth. Let's start with the truth. Only the truth. Uh, I probably spend 100% of my time managing and 100% of my time working on clients. Um, I don't tend to sleep very much and I do try to add in some exercise in between one and the other. Um, look, I'm probably spending 60% of my time managing and 40% of my time dealing with clients. It ebbs and flows over time. You know, I've probably since the 7th of October and the war in Israel spent more time managing and less time with clients and mm -hmm. so it moves. But probably two thirds of my time is managing it, and a third of my time is clients because I actually quite enjoy like some of my clients. So it's fun to keep up to speed with them and keep involved a little. Nice. So, I mean, you mentioned the 7th of October. I mean, everything must have changed. So, uh, drastically since then, um, starting from a, a, glo a, a macro kind of economic point of view, has, has Israel been affected? What's the economics like in Israel? Uh, you know, are there, are there deals happening uh, these days? And more, more specifically, like uh, Herzog and the lawyers, I mean, I know um, a lot of the workforce has been emptied out and gone to serve on the front line. So how, how have you dealt with everything? Um, so, my favourite expression during this war is that I just about know what's happening today, so don't ask me what's happening tomorrow. So, the good thing is your question relates to the past, so I can answer the past. I think if you ask me a question about what will be in the future, that will be more challenging. I might try and answer it if you really ask. Um, so, what happened? Um, clearly, the Israeli economy has been affected. Um, this war... The direct cost of the war is something like a billion shekels a day, 250 million US dollars roughly a day. Um, the war's been going on for 100 days. That is a huge amount of money. Um, the, the economy in this country prior to the 7th of October um, was very strong. Um, you know, we had one of the fastest growing GDPs in the OECD. And we have a huge bunch of reserves. Um, so we can, the Israeli economy will survive the war, um, you know, as we speak, the government is sitting discussing the 2024 budget, um, you know, with the right policies, decisions, however difficult some of those decisions will be, um, the economy will rebound after this war, um, probably, my view, stronger than it was before. Uh, but, you know, with the month of October was um, the blackest month in the history of this country uh, and therefore whilst people were sort of working nobody really was focused on working um, and basically though by the time we got to November I remember doing a zoom for the entire office our office is 750 employees so I had a huge number of boxes on the screen um, and uh, you know I talked everybody through what we'd been doing. Um, we had a minute of remembrance. A whole number of people here lost loved ones on the 7th of October. Two of our lawyers lost uh, brothers, one lost a sister. Um, you know, this is all very personal in Israel. We had at the peak about 100 employees on military reserve duty. We're still at about 75. Um, the office spent a, the office the workers in the office spent a huge amount of time and effort in the first two or three weeks supporting all of those who've been taken to the front line. We were delivering army boots here and food there and, and a whole bunch of weird and wonderful stuff all over the country. But by the time we got to the start of November, um, you know, the economy is part of the war and the economy functioning is an important part of the war. So I gathered, um, everybody who wasn't on reserve duty on Zoom said, look, I do understand that nobody really is focused on work. I have two children in the army. I'm not particularly focused on work, but the functioning of this office, the fact that when a hundred people are on reserve duty, we still feed their families at the end of every month. The fact that 
um, you know, on top of that 100, we probably have another 60 or 70 either with spouses or children in the army. The place needs to function. Um, and we need to make sure that at the end of the month there is from where to pay salaries and really the commitment of everybody to getting back to the coal phase and working was blew me away um, and therefore you know we are busy um, I think one of the amazing facts is and this shows the resilience of the economy um, if you look at all the M&A transactions which were ongoing on the 6th of October so the day before the war only one got cancelled because of the war every other transaction either closed successfully or is ongoing the phone rings every day with inbound transactions investments in tech companies general advice on israeli law um you know the, the international business community has put the wall sort of in a box and said we get it but israel is a hugely successful interesting country that we are absolutely committed to carrying on doing business with so you know from that perspective it's been great and actually you know, working is a great panacea to keep you away from watching the news all day or whatever else we were all doing for the first few weeks of the war. Yeah. Well, it's incredible. I mean, and there's so much uh, impact this war has had on, a, uh, I guess, global, now the ICJ case, political front, uh, initially all the uh, protests and campus uh, activity. Um, I mean, it, does that affect anything that's going on in your world? Do, do, uh, you know, global clients ask about it, question what's going on, or is it kind of business as usual? Um, so clearly during the month of October, everybody was asking what was going on. Um, not just everyone was asking what was going on, the outpouring of support and affection that we got from all over the globe was mind-blowing. Um, you know, the, the lifeblood of this office is international relationships. Um, we are the hub of a huge amount of inbound investment into Israel, but also the practice I do with outbound investment by Israelis outside of Israel. Um, I must have received in the first two weeks hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of messages by email, by WhatsApp, on LinkedIn, on Facebook, on every medium you can think of, from almost every jurisdiction you can think of. Um, so that was really, really heartwarming. Um, and I do think that most people who understand this country and invest in this country and do business in this country realize that unfortunately conflict is part of the DNA um, and therefore, as I say, people were very focused in the first two or three weeks, you know, multinationals who have offices in Israel, you know, if that's the Amazons or Facebooks or Apples or Microsoft or Gs of this world were, okay, what's going on? How does this impact our employees? Mm -hmm. Three weeks later, that was no longer a topic of conversation, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I saw Intel even uh, increase their investment uh, into Israel. Quite absolutely, quite incredible. Uh, last week I was watching the the ICJ spectacle. Um, what's what's the feeling in Israel about this? Uh, are people uh, aware of it or care about it? And I know as lawyers, but the the public, more generally speaking, what's what's the feeling? So it's it's amazing how suddenly. The International Court of Justice has caught everybody's eye. Um, and I've heard from many, many people that they were sitting watching this court hearing. I admit that I've watched bits of excerpts and, and news coverage and, and a couple of my colleagues were very involved in what was going on. I didn't see blue for hours watching it. Um, the ICJ, um, on the one hand, is the highest courts tribunal in the world. Um, on the other hand, it's part of the United Nations and the United Nations, not just from an Israel perspective, but particularly from an Israel perspective, is a very, very difficult, biased organization. Um, so when you look at the case at hand, and this is not the only case involving Israel in the ICJ, but the South Africa case is obviously the one that has taken the headlines. Um, 
the case is absolutely, and lawyers don't normally use this terminology, neither do I normally, the case is absolutely and totally baseless. There is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. To commit genocide, one needs to have, the, without getting into an illness, that's the intention to kill a people because of their definition. Israel was subject to a genocide on the 7th of October. Um, Hamas invaded Israel, a sovereign country, with the sole intention of killing Jews. Unfortunately, um, in their barbarism, they also had no issue with killing Arabs and Christians along the way, and we mourn them just as we mourn the Jews who were lost. Um, South Africa was the first country on the 8th of October, so the day after the Hamas invasion, and whilst we were still counting our dead, South Africa was the first country to issue a statement which basically said the 7th of October was Israel's fault. South Africa was the first country to host a solidarity delegation from Hamas. Um, and therefore, we, whilst we take these proceedings seriously, because they are in the International Court of Justice, um, South Africa is, as it has always been, unfortunately, South Africa is a country and a people that I have a lot of time and affection for. Um, but since the fall of apartheid, South Africa could have turned into um, into this amazing economic jurisdiction. Um, so it reminds me a little of Gaza, because Gaza should have been Singapore. Um, so, you know, I think the Israeli legal team on Friday, um, from what I saw and heard, did a really, really excellent job in setting out the case, it's always difficult when you're defending a case which has no substance to it, but but we will and we'll see how it plays out. You know, the, when you look at the composition of the, of the judges there, um, I'm pretty sure the judge from Lebanon is not going to find in favour of Israel and the judge from China probably won't either, but there's a whole bunch of Westerners there who um, we imagine are slightly more scholarly and less politically influenced than others. Okay. Well, wishing Israel only uh, success and complete victory over there, not only in Gaza, in the court, and all around the world for that matter. Uh, our hearts are with you. I want to get to some uh, general questions now. Just uh, if you picture the young lawyer kind of in law school or trying to graduate or about to graduate, um, a general question, do you have an area of law which you think is up and coming that you suggest someone who's undecided go into? Uh, that's an interesting question because I, I, I sit a lot with students. It's actually one, one of the things I enjoy doing the most is when I get invited to sit with students or students reach out to me on social media. Um, I love engaging. It's, it's, it's great. It's fun. Um, the key is to find something you enjoy doing. And, and I'm trying not to give a cliche answer. But at the end of the day, being a lawyer, it's a pretty demanding job and therefore if you're going to go into a profession which you know as I said already I really enjoy what I do um, but if you're going to go into a profession you need to go into an area which interests you um, and there are a huge number of opportunities in the law um, you know some people watch LA law and suits and all they want to be is a litigator go to court and Objection, me lord, and that's great. And there are other people who have a penchant for real estate. Um, there are people who the high tech world fascinates them. Um, you know, there are people who look at the environmental issues in the world and want to help save the planet and go into environmental law. Um, so I, I don't think there is a one niche that I'd say, look, this is where you need to go because this is how you're going to become the next. Um, legal billionaire. Uh, I think really the key is want to approach it with an open mind because oftentimes trainees, Mimachim, come here on their first day thinking, I want to be the next big shot M&A lawyer and don't really understand what being an M&A lawyer is or, you know, I only want to work in high tech and okay, but you don't know what high tech rooms are that. So yeah. the key is to come with an open mind and find something you enjoy doing because uh, if you don't enjoy doing it, you won't last the marathon. Okay, um, I, 
good good answer and, and the career's many way a journey and you're kind of one thing to the next the next a little bit um in in canadian law they're very advanced in terms of software and even borderline ai but i don't think ai just yet it's more the heavily even reliance on software and and i talk about that from an estates lawyer estate planning estate administration there's corporate software there's software now for personal injury law and family law there's software for real estate uh, transactions I, I use a lot of the software it's costly but it is so much more efficient and accurate and i think better for everybody but as far as i know israel is quite underdeveloped in their use of software uh, can you talk to that? Does does the firm use software to make it more efficient? And uh, and uh, I mean, what what kind of software is there in Israel that I, I may not know of? What a great question. Um, so I think your analysis is the end of your analysis is an accurate one. Let's start with the end and work back. Um, law firms in the startup nation um, don't really use a lot of legal tech software. Uh, but we do, um, and I think one, there's a challenge, and then I'll try and explain where we do use it. The challenge is that in most most real uses today of legal tech, um, are particularly in the area of litigation, um, but also in the area of mass real estate, you know, if you go to a shopping mall with a thousand units, um, both litigation and real estate in Israel is done in the Hebrew language. And we're a small jurisdiction, and therefore, for somebody to take a international legal tech platform and translate it to Hebrew, where we're from right to left and not from left to right, and we have a different alphabet, just the business case is a very difficult one. So there are much less, there's much less availability of product in Israel uh, than in Canada or or the US or, or Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, where we are using legal tech is particularly form generation um, and therefore we have a whole bunch of tools or weird and wacky precedent which people may use and you plug the details in and it um, will we'll get you a pretty useful first draft agreement out so that we're definitely using. Um, you know, the, the, the tech world is very focused on um, these precedents, so we have a whole bunch of tools that we give to our tech clients. Um, but I'm not trying to say that we're at the forefront of legal tech. Um, what's interesting is as a jurisdiction, there's a huge amount of legal tech innovation. A whole bunch of products coming out of Israel. Um, one of my partners, is that's, that's his area of speciality. Um, but very few of them are actually utilized in a very small market, you know. Mm -hmm. Why develop a product in Hebrew if you can develop it in English and attack the world, as it were? Interesting. Okay. So, I mean, without the use of legal tech, another general question for the young lawyers is, in your experience, what makes a good lawyer? What's, uh, you, you've probably come across the, a lot of great ones. I, I know some of them, Daniel Reisner, for example. What, what, what makes a great lawyer? Uh, okay, you've set the bar super high. Daniel Reiser is, is, is our example. Daniel was absolutely one of my favorite people who walk on the planet. Um, uh, the legal profession is changing and evolving. Um, and therefore, your question is a timely one because I think what made a great lawyer five years ago, and 10 years ago, and 20 years ago, and 50 years ago is not the same as what makes a great lawyer today. Let's take as a given that someone understands the law, okay? Because, you know, you can't be a heart surgeon if you don't understand the anatomy of the heart. So let's take as a given that people understand the law, keep up to date with developments in the law of their statutory, of their case law. The question is the delivery to the client. Um, you know, I always joke that when I first joined this place, this is really, really going to make me sound like a dinosaur. But I always joke with the founders of the firm, and you, you mentioned you mentioned three of them, two of whom I had the pleasure of working with. The mail used to come in the morning and in the afternoon. 
the mail didn't jump in every second. You know, I forgot to turn the ping off my mail, so I'm hearing the ping in throughout our call. I hope it's not coming through on the teams. Um, you know, we get bombarded today with communication, which didn't happen in the past. You know, I remember in my first week or second week in the office, I was walking down the corridor and I heard Yaakov Neman's secretary screeching down the corridor. Um, I thought, what had happened? There must be a fire. There must be an emergency. Yaakov, Yaakov, there's an international phone call. Uh, this wasn't that long ago. Um, so because we are bombarded today by communication as lawyers, our ability to respond or our requirements to respond almost instantaneously has risen. Um, you know, there's famous examples that whereas in the past, if somebody asked a lawyer for a legal opinion, they'd get 20 pages, right? Assumptions, facts, legal analysis, conclusion. Uh, today, lawyers give legal opinions by a thumbs up in WhatsApp or by this in WhatsApp or by the word yet. Yeah. Um, so the whole skill set of being a lawyer, one, your requirement to give advice much quicker, your requirement then to give very focused advice because you don't have 20 pages to tell a whole story, right? You, um, and therefore you must be able to articulate your advice much more succinctly much more concisely and in a much more relevant manner to the client. I think one of the biggest complaints I hear as managing partner from clients is I don't want theoretical advice. You know, don't tell me the law. Take it, lie to my situation, give me the bottom line. And therefore that that is what I call value-added legal services. It's giving advice which is relevant to the client on a real-time basis. Um, that is a totally different legal world to not that long ago, actually, but that's, that's a requirement today. Mm -hmm. That is the number one requirement for young lawyers. And I think it also makes the profession more interesting, right? It's much more dynamic. You're um, much more hectic, but much more dynamic. Yeah, it just made me think of... Uh the fact that I don't like uh, billing by the hour, I prefer giving a flat fee for the client. And uh, you know, the when you're responding with legal advice with a thumbs up, thumbs down, it's hard to bill too much for that type of uh, quick response. So uh, you have to bill for the, the knowledge, all that you've learned over the years, but uh, it's an interesting different structure to back in the day where you had to write a whole legal opinion. Yeah, look, you know, <laughs> It's interesting that, co that that concept of hourly billing, and we are a law firm that bills by the hour. We don't, I think, billing by the hour is probably only half of what we do. Everything else is fixed. Um, whoever dreamt up the concept of billing by the hour, and I've always meant to go and Google and Wikipedia, whoever dreamt up this concept, I always give the example of the plumber. You know, let's say you wake up in the morning and your kitchen sink is broken, and it's all the gunges not going down the plug hole. And you phone the plumber and you say, look, SOS, can't wash the dishes, sink is blocked, please come. Of course, plumber turns up, looks at the sink, you say to plumber, how much is this gonna cost me? You expect plumber to say, $100. Plumber doesn't say $100, plumber says, it costs $100 an hour. And however long it takes me, is what you'll pay. You would take the plumber and throw him out of the house, right? Um, so therefore, this concept of hourly billing um, is an interesting, quaint concept, which, which again, we do a lot of hourly billing, but but I think the world is moving away from that, slowly, but but moving away. But that, that's just one of my bugbears, is hourly billing. Uh -huh. Interesting. As a, a final word, kind of what general advice would you give to either your younger self or younger lawyer or both? Um, wow. Um, make sure that this is really what you want to do. Um, and if you're not sure it's what you want to do, then try it out. Um, you know, I think one of the, one of the challenges today generally in 
the work environment. This was probably exacerbated post-pandemic, but existed a little before. Is you know, people jumping left and right, and right and left, and looking here and looking there. Um, and the only way to really become a successful lawyer is to commit to it over time. Uh, there is one thing, and again, I'm trying not to sound like a dinosaur, but there is one thing that really differentiates lawyers from others, and you mentioned one of my partners, Dan Arisa, who's a prime example, and that's experience. You know, when you've seen more situations, your ability to give um, better advice to your clients increases, and you can't shortcut experience. So if this is what you want to do, buy into it, be patient. It's a really great, interesting profession, but um, takes time. Um, you know, it's not like filling in the lottery and your numbers came up. Mm -hmm. um, I know in other jurisdictions like Canada, maybe I think something like 50-60% uh, uh, of people who pass the bar or have a law degree practice law and the other 40 or 50% move on to other careers. Is that similar in Israel too? And, and in your experience, do, do you know uh, other kind of springboard careers? Is there any kind of natural progression? Uh, people at Herzog kind of feel, not for me, what what have they gone on to succeed in if they have? Yeah, let, let, me, let me try and unravel those questions. So, you know, the old joke was every Jewish mother wanted her son or daughter to be a lawyer or a doctor, right? Um, that, that disappeared now. Every Jewish mother wants their son or daughter to be a high-tech entrepreneur with options and, um, and IPOs and exits and all the rest of it. Um, so, yes, I, I'm not sure exactly what the number is, but very, very many people in Israel study law uh, with no intention of being lawyers. Um, I may make a politically incorrect statement. Um, too many people study law in Israel. Um, there's just too many. We have as many, at least we did three or four years ago, we have as many lawyers, the absolute number of lawyers, as they do in Japan. Um, this is a tiny country, Japan, the big one. So we've got a lot of lawyers. Um, so yes, many people study law with no intention of being lawyers, probably less today than it used to be. Um, people leave us. Um, why would anybody leave Herzog? People do, um, because of, and, and this, is, this is not an arrogant statement, because of our position in the market, the number of people who leave us to go to other law firms is barely, almost never happens. Um, and therefore people leave us either to go in-house or if they're leaving the law. Um, and again, this was probably at its peak in the year after the pandemic was over. Um, we had a whole bunch of people leaving to do business roles, um, probably in the last few months that's, well, things have been very stagnant, less people move positions during the war, I assume, um, but people who leave here tend to go um, to business positions rather than to legal positions. Mm -hmm. um, I thank you for your time during this uh, you know, difficult wartime, making the time. I'm sure you're extremely busy with all your different roles and everything that's going on in Israel. Um, we're hoping only for the best. You mentioned your two boys are serving in the army, wishing them a safe return home and a complete victory, of course. And, uh, Thank you so much. Actually, boy and a girl, so one, of each, one of each in the army. Wow, incredible. Incredible. I mean, I'll, I'll give you the last word, but. Uh, I want to just uh, take this time to thank you and wish you uh, only the best during this difficult time. Thank you. Um, firstly, you were my light relief from, from managing the office, so thank you for inviting me. Um, you know, I think, I think the key message is, you know, this is, I live in an amazing country. I made a positive decision to move here 23 years ago and would never want to live anywhere else, despite the difficulties. It's a vibrant, exciting, forward-looking um, country which is going through a war it never wanted. It has no choice but to win this war. Um, and the day after the war, 
Um, we look forward to welcoming the tourists back to the beaches of Tel Aviv and the distant people back to our conference centre. And I share your wish for better days ahead and thank you for inviting me, Avi. Gil, I hope to uh, see you around at some point soon and uh, again wishing you all the best. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.